Hey, buddy. Senor, how are you? I'm good. Good to see you, man. Good to see you. It was obviously an enormous plum, I think, for our series to get you doing the music for it and, and um, scoring it. And I guess one of the places for us to begin is maybe you could speak towards what in the material spoke to you and, and how that guided your musical creation. Well, the first thing, four scripts came at once, which was about, I don't know, 300 pages or something like yeah, that. Yeah. I read them and it was like a book. I, I had to know what happened, so I had to get the next four scripts. Like, it was extraordinary to read a script that had long speeches in it. It read like a novel and it also read like a movie. <laughs> Except it was a television show. It was a, a very interesting. It read like neither of the things it was supposed to be. And the next interesting step was talking to you guys, and you guys saying you didn't want to do a typical Louisiana Cajun music score or you know sound because, and that would that would not have been nearly as intriguing as the idea of creating a, an alternate reality where it's a, not a kind of Louisiana we've heard before. So all this stuff tends to come from Louisiana, but from a, from sideways, you know, it's... Yeah, it seems to me it comes more from the psychology of the place yeah. rather than its its exact musical history. Yeah. And, and that's exactly what we were hoping for. I find so many times in, in the actual episodes, the emotional communication that's happening between characters is enhanced. By, by a very subtle score behind things. And I don't think many people have gotten to see that from you. I had my time where I wonder if this was all in my head. That time passed. Really? What happened to Billy Lee Duddle? There's something you're gonna have to look at. No other way around it. It's interesting that you bring up the idea of um, a sort of Louisiana of the mind, right? Right. <clears throat> As opposed to the to the historical musical scene of Louisiana, which none of us wanted to do. Right. And 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 that can bring up you know this idea of anachronisms and things like that. And like um, I think I read some comment somewhere that you know struck me as completely ridiculous. <laughs> that KRS-One would not be playing in a South Louisiana strip club. No K business controls America. Ganja business controls America. KRS For a man who was in Louisiana in 1995 and, and worked at a strip club, there's no political statement behind the music that plays for girls to dance to at strip clubs. Um, but it, th that's the kind of comment that I wonder if you have anything to say to that. Of course, it's completely plausible that a DJ, to the DJ in Louisiana in 1995 would have heard illegal business. You know, but more than that, it was the right song to play in that scene. We tried a lot of songs to play in that scene. And, it, and when that one went in there, everyone said, oh, there it is. Yep. It showed up. It's appropriate for True Detective in 2014 and, what the, and, what, and the story we're telling. He's conflict-oriented, so when I deny him small arguments, it builds up his energy. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Are you ever a match wow. for this dude? I've read some interesting commentary about this show from the po point of view of some women. There's a there's a test about the way women are treated. They yeah. have to relate to each other. I can't yeah. remember the name of the test, but it's an interesting test. Anyway, I thought you should be given the chance to represent yeah. what, how you actually feel about well, women. Well, you know, I think if that's a deficiency in the show, I can only say that that deficiency is inherent in its form because the form of this show is a close point of view, right? right? Two so cameras. you have two points of view, yeah. and it's Russ Cole's point of view and or Martin Hart's point of view, and that's it. We don't go into other characters' points of view. We don't go into Maggie's point of view if she's not with Cole or Hart. That's right. And now, if you can find me a male character who's treated with great depth and intelligence and given <laughs> his due, right. who's not Hart and Cole, let me know. It's my bad, boys. Maybe we got started on the wrong foot there. To me, these men are heroes. These men are real men that do bad things and do the best they can, and they're living by their own codes as best they can. But the thing they do, they confront outrageous evil head on, face to face. They look right into the skull of the most hideous evil imaginable and deal with it. That's heroic. 
to me, Cole more than Hart, but both of them are heroic. Right. And now, both of them are incredibly flawed as men in society, right? Like, Hart might be a bad husband and father. Cole might be a terrible friend and colleague in some respects. But they both behave with bravery and with honor. Yeah. In, in moments where, where many of us might not. Two bars back there, clearing's from the mind. All right. Yeah, you won't do it. You go back, call it in. I'll wait here. Do it now, Marty. You ain't doing this without me. One of the neat things about episode five to me is that Cole, up to that point, has been the guy who has represented a black and white morality. But in episode five, it's Hart, the man who has offered nothing but gray areas of morality, who administers absolute justice to Reggie Ledoux right. by executing him. Right. Boom. Now, it's an interesting thing to me that through episode four and episode five, in none of the action scenes does Cole fire a gun. Right. Even though he's supposed to be the most dangerous man in the right. script, yeah. and he is. Yeah, right. He only fires a gun when all the danger's passed and he's unloading that AK. For me, he's what Huck Finn becomes in the 21st century, mm. you know? You remember Huckleberry Finn when he could free Slave Jim, but everything he's been taught tells him that if I free this man, I'm going to hell. Yeah. I'm going to burn in hell forever. Yeah. And Huck Finn frees his friend, the slave, and Huck says, basically, fuck it, I'll go to hell. Yeah. And that's Rust. You wonder ever you're a bad man? No, I don't wonder, Marty. You ever wonder if you're a bad man? No, I don't wonder. Yeah. You know, not, not saying like, no, I don't think I'm a bad man. No, I don't wonder about I, I it. I know I'm a I know bad I'm a man. bad man. Yeah. But I'm better than the other bad men. Yeah, I don't. I didn't rip at, at anybody's on, face off. I'm on this side of the line. Right. And the other bad men are on that side of the line. No, he's a good man, actually. He's I, a bad. He's a good bad man. The world needs bad men. We keep the other bad men from the door. They are, despite their sins, incorruptible. Yeah, that's right. They. You know, listen, I wouldn't go into that house where that woman was, that sister, half-sister. I would not go in there. You think I'd walk in that maze full of twig sculptures? No, I wouldn't go it? in there, man. No. So, you know, I, we can all sit back anonymously and throw rocks and say, oh, yeah, they're not heroes. So deal with the re We have to deal with the reality of who these guys, are, you know. Well, you know, I even heard something that, like, they were bad cops because they're not solving this as fast as the mentalist or somebody would solve it, <laughs> you know? And yeah. I'm like... <laughs> well, you're supposed to solve it in an episode. You, yeah, I was like, you know, what do you guys think the Louisiana State Police is, you know, do you think, this is 1995, you think they've seen Seven? You think they've watched CSI? You think CSI is real? <laughs> you know? Marty. This is the place. The ending of the show, more than anything for me, is about catharsis. We've yes. taken you on this eight hours, and I want you to experience as an audience a release yes. of everything. How did you interpret that release? These two guys that I really loved, I really loved both of these guys. And seeing, seeing the kind of gauntlet they were willing to run, the kind of hell they were really willing to run into, to find that catharsis, to reach that catharsis. And there was no other way they were gonna get there than to stare straight into the skull. We left something undone. We gotta fix it. Man remembers his debts. And that to me is a heroic moment, you know, that they decided they had a debt. Right. And they didn't flinch from that debt. There was a moment I know when I, was, when I was under in the dark, there's something I could feel, man. And I knew, I knew my daughter waited for me there. So clear, I could feel her. And all I had to do was let go, man. And I did. He moves about five inches on right. the personality meter, right? right? But where he moves to is a place where, for the first time, he's allowed to grieve. <laughs> and then I woke up. When you see Matthew kill that scene with his tears and, yeah. and his raw emotion, 
Think about the last time Russ Cole cried, if ever. 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 Right. Right. This is a man who's probably been waiting his whole life to cry. I tell you, Marty, I've been up in that room looking out those windows every night here, and just thinking, it's just one story. The oldest. Oh, Chad. Light versus dark. Here's to me that the dark has a lot more territory. In that final metaphor, it's an earnest urge to merge the secular with the sacred. Mm. Yeah, I hear that. And you know, uh, there was darkness, and the Lord said unto the darkness, let there be light. Is, is someone struggling, not even struggling, just wondering, yeah. is, is, is there some kind of metaphor that, that takes it all in? Yeah. Well, what's the story about it? It's very basal level, light versus dark. And then when you consider, well, wait a minute, once upon a time, it was all a void. And now there's lights exploding everywhere. Yeah. It's, it's, it's almost full, you know, and, and they just keep coming, these stars. They just right. keep coming. You know, you're looking at her on the sky, I think. How's that? Well, once there was only dark. And you ask any lights went in. I did want to touch on that, though, because uh, I didn't, I wasn't sure it would make sense to a lot of people, and it might not. Well, it's, it's it's a beautiful part of the fabric of the of the whole play. Thank you. And you know, <clears throat> I must say, since we're here at the end, th it's so beautiful that it ends like a novel. You know, there's no feeling in the world like getting to the end of a good book when the writer just nails it for you and wraps it up, and you read the last few words. Oh, and, thanks. And this does that. One of the problems of serialized storytelling on television is. <clears throat> you do a series and you have a first act, a second act, and a third act, and then if the series gets picked back up, the third act goes well, on. Well, you don't have a third act. You have a yeah. second act that goes on interminably. Yeah, so I'm looking forward to people being able to sit down and watch it over a weekend, you know, because it actually does have a true ending. Thanks. I'd really like to talk to you about the final song that ends the series because it's an original T-Bone Burnett song. And as a writer and a poet, I thought the lyrics were incredibly beautiful. Growing out of our discussions of the, the show and the country and the story we were telling, this song suddenly appeared. And then this music grew out of the score, really, this theme, the, the main theme of True Detective. That it grew out of that and this psychosphere theme that we had sort of merged into the angry river. Have you ever heard this phrase before? I haven't, and I just, I mean, I thought it was one of the most perfect gothic expressions I'd heard. That's, an that's angry what I river. think. Well, I think there was a children's book, but when I heard the phrase angry river, I, it's been something completely different to me. Yeah. And it certainly has meaning when you put it into this play and into Louisiana and... Well, I thought it was an American classic. As far as the music goes, it's, it has very much been a collaboration among, among all of us, but with you and, and uh, Matthew, too. Matthew suggested a lot of good music. Yeah, he really... And you know from my scripts, I called a ton of music, but yeah. it was never meant to be like you have to use this. But it was great, so we well, did. Well, I just knew we were speaking the same language. There was a because... reason that song's there. And... Yeah, and like it doesn't need to be this song, but there's something this yeah. song does that you can tap into. That's right. right. But so much of it I was just thrilled with. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. This is, uh, your music is, is one of the main leads of the show, and, and I consider it as essential a part of the vocabulary of True Detective as, as my writing, at least. Oh, so man, thank, well, you. thank you. Thank you. You're the greatest. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.